Hey, good morning, everybody. Why don't you stand up with us? Let's just open in a word of prayer. We want to welcome everybody online as well. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're just really excited this morning just to bring, uh, last week Pastor Keith talked about having a heart connection with God. And so that this whole morning, we're just going to focus on that, just bringing our hearts, bringing everything we have to Jesus this morning in our worship, in our, in our honoring him with our time and our, and our words. And so why don't we just, we just bow in a word of prayer real quick. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. We just thank you that you are here with us. We thank you that when we, when we seek you, we find you. We thank you that when we search for you with all our heart, that you will always be there. You will always answer us. You are, you are here in the midst of us. And so we just bring, we bring our hearts to you this morning, and we just honor you with everything that we have. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Buried beneath my shame, who could carry that kind away? It was my turn till I met you. I was free. Yes. 
away even in the midst of the, the toughest days even in the midst of some of our hardest moments we can always count on him so this morning as we continue to sing let's just give him our absolute best just bring everything that we've brought into the to church this morning everything that we brought with us Let's just all lay it all down. Any anxieties and fears. Any miracles that we need. Maybe there's something in your life that you're facing right now. The fear is just crippling. But this morning is an opportunity to lay that all down at the feet of Jesus. Because none of this matters. None of this really matters. The music doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't really matter who's standing beside you or in front of you. But what matters is that we give our hearts to God. We just let Him come in and just do whatever He wants to do. Just let Him work on your heart this morning. your heart 
I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry Jesus. King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve. So take all of me. So take all of me. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things are. You're looking into. My heart, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, but it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus, I'm sorry Lord, the thing I've made it, and it's all about you, it's all Jesus, I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Lord. Come into our hearts. Work on our hearts today.
Before we do, we're just going to just play as instruments. And I really just want us to just quiet our hearts. Just try to forget about all the distractions. Just try to forget about all the questions that you have in your heart this morning. Just quiet your heart and focus on Him. Just focus on giving Him everything that's bogging you down this morning. All those thoughts of doubt and fear. 
all those thoughts that maybe God's done with you or maybe doesn't have a plan for you. Try to put off any thoughts that you won't receive your healing or you won't receive that financial miracle that you've been waiting for. Just quiet your heart and just focus on His promises.
we just come to you this morning. We just give you all our heart. sense that God's working on some hearts this morning. You know, the word that just keeps coming to me, just keeps ringing in my, in my spirit is unworthiness. I don't know who that word is for, but there's some people here that don't feel worthy. They don't feel worthy of being used by God. Maybe you're afraid to step out into some kind of ministry or some kind of calling that you feel God pulling on your heart because you feel like things from your past or maybe some things that you're working through right now disqualify you from God's call. But nothing can be further from the truth. The Bible says that all of God's gifts in His call are irrevocable. As long as we've given our hearts to Jesus, any feelings of unworthiness, any feelings of doubt or fear or lack. You might be saying, I know that I want to be used by God, but what do I have to give? What do I have to offer? Or maybe you're thinking there's other people that would be better at this than me. But you know, God didn't he doesn't just call perfect people. He calls each and every one of us. He says, if you give me your heart, if you follow my heart, I'll take you places you never dreamed. I'll do things in your life that you never thought possible. You'll see miracles. You'll see victories. Because when you give God your heart, when you fully give him everything you have, then we leave space. We make room for his heart to work in our lives. Let's just sing this one more time. to sing this song in faith. Say, God, use me in whatever way you will. Have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Live for you alone. Every 
every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. some people just experiencing healing right now, but they need a little more time. And there's a lot of distraction going on because you know what? We're all here and there's children, there's all sorts of things. But Dallas, if I could have you just dim the lights, please, in the main part, please. And I'm just going to ask everyone to sit down. And I want you to just close yourself in right now with God. And I, I just would ask that you not be looking around. And I know that we've sung this song quite a few times, but I'm asking you to just close your eyes. Right now, I can see as I look out, there's those of you that are totally entering in. You're worshiping. God is right here. He's right there with you. And then there are those of you that are distracted, you're thinking about other stuff, worries, cares, whatever. And if you need a healing right now, God is here to heal. If you need restoration in a marriage, God is here to heal. If you need freedom from the past, things that still are dragging on, things that have happened and they've hurt you, and sometimes you become harsh, unkind to people around you it's because you're not completely healed when you're healed you're at peace I just want us all to just be as quiet as we can before the Lord ask him ask him to heal those parts of your heart that you have still been holding on to ask him to take the pain so that it doesn't sting. Ask him to open up your heart to what he has for you in the future. And we're just going to take a few moments just as the musicians play. You know what? There's none of us that are worthy to stand in God's presence. None of us. None of us. But because of his grace, because Jesus went to the cross, we're all righteous in his eyes. Amen. So you know what? It doesn't matter about the past. It doesn't matter what's happened. All that matters is that we give it to Jesus and let him heal it. And I feel his presence here today. And those of you that decide to enter in and just absolutely grab a hold of it, I believe today can be life-changing that you can leave here today knowing, knowing that you are free, that God has a call, a, 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 a reason for you to still be here. Amen? There's so many people right now that are facing such turmoil. And right in our own church, um, people are in the hospital. People are dealing with serious illnesses. But you know what? God is our healer. God is their healer. God is your healer. Amen. So let's just be quiet in his presence. Let him just move in each one of our hearts right now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
thank you that as you are just here right now, moving, Father, quieting hearts, Father, I ask you to just bring your holy presence, just that we would sense, Father God, just the magnitude of your power, God. It's hard to stand in your presence, but we thank you, God, that you made us righteous because of Jesus, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That because of you, Jesus, we can stand, we can come freely into your throne room. And right now, we just want to offer up our hearts to you. We're asking God for you to heal. Heal those hurts from the past, God, that need to be gone. You've forgotten them. They're in the deepest sea of forgetfulness, God. Help us not to dig them up, Father. Father, help us to watch our words as we talk with each other, as we encourage each other that we're not the cause, Father, of causing someone to hurt or to stumble, Father. Help us, Father, to be kind, to be loving, Father, as you were kind and loving. Jesus, move. Move on hearts today. Heal. Heal where there has been the enemy has thought that he had the upper hand, but he doesn't. He doesn't. You're defeated, Satan. We declare that again today. You have no power. No power. You have no power over our families. You have no power over our lives in any way because of Jesus' blood. And we just worship you. We worship you, Father. We give you praise, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you today. You're an awesome God. Lord, we thank you so much for your love in our lives, Lord. Father, I pray that every person here and every person watching online would just get a fresh revelation of that, of how much you love us. We stand in awe of you, Lord. We stand in awe of your presence. We give you all the glory.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's something special about... I, I love a song that talks about our breath. Because it's God who gave us life. He gave us breath, right? And I love, I love it when it says, Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, literally every moment that I am alive on this earth, I give you praise. And I honor you, God, so we just thank you and praise you for that. Hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you, worship team, for leading us today into God's presence. I love that it looks different every Sunday, right? You know, one Sunday we'll be jumping up and down and dancing and rejoicing, and the next Sunday we're on our knees just honoring God. But it's it's all about Him, right? And uh, I know that song, it's... I mean, it's an old song, but yeah. When when everything fades, when all the things fade away, it's all about Him. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Well, thank you. Thank you. I don't have to tell you to sit down. You already are, so it's okay. Praise God, Pastor Jean. I think we're just going to stay in an attitude of worship and just dismiss the children. So if children today, if you can just go, um, your teachers are... Miss Donovan, Miss Miss Calla, and Mr. Donovan, and you're going to go just quietly to your class, and we'll just pray over them as they go. Father, we thank you for these little ones. Father, thank you that you are moving in their hearts. God, thank you that they already know, Father God, who you are, and they praise you, Father, with their hearts, with pure childlike hearts, Father. With nothing in the way, God. Father, I pray that we as adults can come to a place of just childlike faith, God. Just trusting you because you said it in your word. We declare that today for each person here right now. Those that are watching online, Father, be very near to them right now. Minister to their hearts, Father. Those that are in the hospital right now, Father, Be very near to them, Father. Father, you said you would never leave them, never forsake them. You were there with them. You were giving wisdom to the doctors, Father. Father, you were healing their bodies even now. Father, I thank you that any that are here today, Father, no sickness can be among us, Father. We We just believe that. We declare that, Father for healing to flow, Father, in every person here today. Your healing, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm on here. (laughs) Hallelujah. Honey, can you bring me my uh, uh, notes there, please? Praise God. Wow. Amen, 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 amen. I love it when God is doing something and um, we, we just have to wait on him, right? Hallelujah. 
Jesus. Oh, As I was preparing my message today, uh, I, I knew Dale was working on his list, and I knew, I knew some of the songs that he was going to pick. And uh, I, I have to admit, like it, it did influence me, <laughs> at least it, in terms of where I started, uh, or actually where I started was with the second part of my message, but then. I, I just felt like we just needed to give place for the Holy Spirit today, right? And it's, it's so, so, so awesome. Um, for those of you that aren't aware or didn't know, or maybe you're watching online and you wonder why is Pastor Keith wearing a Raptors jersey? Well, today we had declared would be uh, Jersey Sunday. And we do this every once in a while when there's a big sporting event and uh, I know some churches, the the pastors, like they have a different influence, like some, you know, they, whatever their background is, whatever has influenced them in their lives, they tend, that tends to come out. And so I won't make any apologies today for the fact that um, we have had some fun with sports over the years. And as a result, uh, when there's a big event like today, and for those of you watching online, if you don't happen to be watching this on, live or on the same day, today happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. So how many are excited about Super Bowl? Okay. <laughs> how many could care less about the Super Bowl? Okay. 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 Well, yeah, yes. Okay. Well, we're believing God for more in 2024. How's that? I think we can get an agreement about that. Now, I want to say uh, before I get started that uh, for those of you that are football fans and even for those of you that are not football fans, at the end of my message, I hope to uh, predict with 100% accuracy who will win today's game. How many are excited about that? You're excited? Okay. I, just, I think may, there might be some skeptics. Well, you'll see. Okay. Okay. We've been talking about uh, what our walk is like as Christians, and uh, I today I, I know I know some churches they just are totally oblivious. They'll have a special guest speaker come from out of town and have a you know an evangelistic meeting on a Sunday like today, but you know we're kind of sensitive to people who would enjoy the game, and so I try not to. I try to follow the theme. Actually, I try to to tailor my message around what's happening in in society and what might be of interest to people. And uh, being a champion is something that I I love. I love it. I I I thought it was fantastic when they put the sign up, uh, City of Champions. Amen. And uh, maybe we should get in agreement and just pray that they'll uh, put the sign back up again because. You know, it doesn't matter whether the sports teams are winning or losing. The, the heart of a champion is what the attitude is of the people, right? And so uh, we need to, let's just pray that they'll put the sign back up. Anyhow, uh, when we talk about teams and we talk about sports, like, I just, I love, I love team sports. It's something that I enjoy. And uh, uh, I, I know last week I, I talked about using love in a loose context and not pertaining to God. But anyhow, I really enjoy team sports, okay? So I don't know if I love it or not, but whatever. It gets in my, in my uh, blood. And uh, now, I, it's not that I don't enjoy individual sports. Like, I, I have done lots of individual sports. I really like golf, okay? I enjoy golfing. But I don't enjoy golfing alone. Is there anybody that likes to golf alone? Like that's a, that is an individual sport where you're golfing alone. It's just you and you and that ball, right? But I don't like to, I like golfing, but I don't like to golf alone. But I do like team sports and uh, there's all, all kinds of teams, like there's sports teams. We have teams in the business sector that, that often that term gets used quite often where it's talking about a group of people who have a common purpose to try and achieve common goals together. And uh, they're uh, one of the significant ones that, that I think of 
is military teams. And I know Dallas has uh, read a number of books about uh, the SEAL teams, right? And we talk about SEAL teams. And when, when we think of those guys, they are putting their life on the line for something, right? Those SEAL teams, the military teams, those kinds of teams. But you know what? Church has teams too. And uh, I want to talk, we, I want to talk about a little bit about being a team today. We have a worship team. That's what we had today. The worship team led us into worship, right? We have a leadership team that makes decisions and direction for the church. We have a ministry team. There are people who, who give out to minister to other people within our, our church, right? And guess what? All of you are on Team City View. Okay, I don't know how excited. The, okay, let's work on that again, Okay. All of you are on Team City View. Yes. Okay, there we go. Oh, that's what I wanted. Okay. So what does it mean to be on the team and what does it look like? Now, last week, yes, Dale already referenced it. We had we talked about the heart connection and God's amazing love for us and his love in you and through you, right? And uh, today's worship really was a demonstration of connecting our hearts with God's heart. Amen? I mean, I didn't need to stand up here and preach a message. We could have just worshiped God, and we would have gotten what we needed. Amen? But I want to jump over into Ephesians uh, and spend a little bit of time. I'm going to start over in Ephesians chapter 3, and... uh, I've got my New International Bible here, so we'll I'll, uh, mostly be reading from New International. But uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 14, and just to put it in context. Now, this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and it, this is his, pr- it says, the heading in my Bible says, a prayer for Ephesians, right? For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It's interesting. I've never really thought about that until I read this. Like every family in heaven and on earth, like so whether your family is in heaven or whether your family is on earth, whether your family is comprised of people that are blood relatives or whether the only family you have is your church family, guess what? We all get its name because of our Father in heaven. We are his children. That makes us family. That makes us one, right? Verse verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Everybody say love. You being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Who are the Lord's holy people? Us, right? His church, the holy people. To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. That's the thing we want to grasp. That's the thing that we want to get a hold of. We want to get a hold of how awesome God is and how much, how much he loves us, right? And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. In other words, it's really hard to comprehend the love. It's really hard to comprehend how much God loves us. And sometimes, sometimes you know, we, we have a, like if we look around us and we look at people and, the, you know, they're people that really care. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm amazed at how much Pastor Gene loves me, right? It, that's amazing. But guess what? God loves me so much more. He loves me in a way that it's almost hard to comprehend. Why would God love me that much? And yet he does, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, right? He wants to fill us with a a revelation of that love that he has for, for us. Amen? And so... It's just love is God's way. And it is so, it's so simple to understand, and yet it's so hard in some ways to comprehend that love is God's way. Well, that brings me to today, and I want to talk about whose team are you on, right? I, okay, so whose team are you on? 
Oh, okay. You were listening. Yeah. Team City View. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, it was, this was like an open book test, right? I gave you the answer before I asked you the question. Okay. Anyhow, so I, I thought for today for fun, uh, being a sports day that I'd do an acrostic uh, and use the letters of team. And uh, because of that, I might jump around a little bit in terms of the scripture references. And these are in no particular order, except they are in the order of T-E-A-M, team. Okay. So the first, uh, the first letter is what? T. T. Okay. Now, do we have T or is it, uh, we got some issues? Okay. We're having some problems up there. Okay. That's okay. The first letter is T. And it is, stands for training, okay? Ooh, training. Maybe that sounds, like a, that sounds like a curse word or a bad word. It sounds like a lot of work, right? But let's, let's, look, let's look first in Scripture, okay? Ephesians chapter 4. John, this is what I say. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Wow. So the body of Christ may be built up so that we can be trained and equipped, right? And and then it goes on to say, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Wow, that almost sounds like a, a mouthful, right? Just to read it like that. But here's the thing. God wants us to grow up. And part of growing up in him is understanding what it means what he, how much he loves us, understanding his word, spending time in his word. Many, many times we talk about how important the word of God is in this church. And I, I know some of our friends, they used to call their church word of faith because they were building their faith based on the word of God. Well, we are too, right? We just don't particularly have that in our name. But the principle is there. That if we put the word first in our life, if we make it first place, this is where we will get the things that we need to, to just be all that God wants us to be and to achieve all that he wants us to achieve and to experience and possess all that he has given to us, all that he has provided. It is the word of God that brings that, right? So let, let me read it again. Um, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for a second. There's an attitude sometimes that people get. And they don't, it's not based on the word of God. But they get the attitude of, well, that's the pastor's job. Or, well, we have apostles to do that. Or, or the evangelists will go out and get everybody saved. Or... The teachers, well, they'll do all the work. They'll, they'll, they'll train everybody as to how they should be taught, right? But guess what? That's not what it says. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't say that they're going to do the work of the ministry, okay? Let me read it again. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people, to equip you to do the work of the ministry, to, for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. How is the body of Christ built up? The body of Christ is built up when you do your part, when you get built up, and when you understand that you are to do the works of the ministry. Every one of you is on Team City View, okay? But every one of you is in the family of God. And you have a calling, you have a purpose. There is a plan for your life. That purpose and plan is just, just an individual. Maybe you just touch one other life. I know I talked about my mom uh, previous weeks about how she, she had a heart for our neighborhood. Like every kid that lived on our street, she made sure they heard about Jesus and had the opportunity to accept him as their savior, right? And you know what? After the kids got saved, then she'd invite, okay, this was good, a great, uh, great example of evangelism in, in, uh, in action, right? My mom wasn't anything special in the church, 
But she had a heart because, you know what? Because it meant so much to her that she got born again. And so she would get all these kids saved. She didn't, she'd have them over to her house, to our house, right? I grew up with this, okay? She would teach them scripture. She'd get them memorizing scripture. Wow, that's powerful when you can get kids memorizing scripture, right? And uh, she would get them to memorize all these scripture verses. And then what she'd do, she'd invite all the parents to come over to hear these children quote their scripture. Oh, you need to come because we, it, it was like a, it was like a, you know how some people go to like piano recitals and stuff and you hear everybody playing their songs? Well, my mom, she would say, you moms and dads, you all need to come over to our house. And she would pack the living room with people who had come for what? To hear these kids quote scripture boy oh boy talk about putting the word she was putting the word in the kids and then she was evangelizing the parents right and I think half of them all got saved I don't you know it'll be interesting when I get to heaven and see how many people off our block where I grew up because I lived in the I don't know how many can relate to this but I lived in the same house for 18 years of my life anybody can relate to that 18 years I lived in the same house. So I was on the same street. I grew up. I saw all the kids that grew up. We, we were all on that street. And it'll be so much fun when we get to heaven and see how many kids and how many parents off that street are all in heaven because my mom had a simple, simple mission field. It was just one block long, right? Two sides of the street, one block. But she wanted to get everybody saved. Well, you know what? She understood this. She understood that it wasn't the pastor's job to come down to our neighborhood and talk to everybody on our street. She understood that the, you know, the apostles who had established the church and built it and founded it and you know, established the principles that we were, of faith that we were learning and growing by, it wasn't their job to come by and talk to our next door neighbor, right, about Jesus. It was her job and she got it, right? And it's just such a simple concept. But if we could all get, get that in our, in our hearts, we'd understand how important it is that God has equipped us, equipped every one of us to do the work of the ministry, right? Okay, so tell a quick story. Are we able to put up the picture of the uh, basketball? Okay, here's a picture. I don't know if you can see this picture, and I don't know if online if you're able to see, but anyhow, I'm the good-looking guy over there on the right. Man, okay. And the, the wonderful young man right in the middle who's way taller than everybody else is who? I may, you may not recognize him because he still has hair here, right? Okay, this is Dale. Okay. And the little guy, right by my shoulder, right there, he barely comes to my shoulder. Can you believe that? That's Dallas. Wow. Okay. So anyhow, this was our 2003-2004 uh, Alder Grove basketball team. And you know what? Uh, one of my greatest pleasures in life, <laughs> and I... I, I Obviously, Raptors, right? I'm a basketball fan. But one of the greatest uh, things that I did was when I got to coach basketball. And not only did I get to coach Dallas, but I got to coach with Dale. Because, see, Dale was enough older that he was, he was one of the co-coaches with me, right? We coached together. And I learned as much from Dale as I did uh, from everything else, you know, because he played basketball. And so he was, sometimes the coach was coaching the coach, right? But when I first started out, when I first volunteered for this gig, okay, when I first volunteered to be a basketball coach, I didn't know anything. And I think I've told this story before, but it was, it's quite funny. Actually, it was at, a, it was at one of Dale's games. And uh, I thought that the assistant coach was supposed to sit and just take notes and, uh, you know, hand the kids their water bottles, right? Except that Dale's coach decided he had to go away on business. Well, he didn't decide. He got sent out of town on business for a couple of weeks. So guess who got volunteered to coach the team? Yeah, and I knew nothing. I, I, <laughs> I still remember we were in the Ross Shepherd High School gymnasium. We've got a whole gymnasium there. We show up with the kids 
And I said, okay, now what do we do? Well, we have a team cheer, we'll get started, right? And then now what do we do? Well, we've got to put somebody on the court, you know, so you've got to decide who's on the court. How do we decide who goes on the court? I don't know. So what I did was we sent five kids out there, and then I, and then I looked at the kids that were still on the bench, and I said, tell me when we're supposed to send somebody else out, right? <laughs> That's how bad it was. Okay, so I decided if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. Okay, so I went to chapters, bought a book, coaching kids, how to teach kids basketball or coach basketball, right? And I learned all, all the principles, okay? It was hard work. It, I had to learn some things I didn't know. I had, I had to learn how to dribble a basketball. This is quite an important skill in basketball, right? I had to learn how to dribble one, right? But I read the book, you know, got out in the driveway. Oh, man, this is bad. <laughs> but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And I learned. And a few years later, we were coaching with a, uh, we had the opportunity to coach. It's not this guy. This was, this was Brett um, Whittington in this picture. But later, we had the opportunity to coach with um, a fellow that had played five years of university basketball. So this guy, he knew basketball. He'd played at a high level. And he said, I remember him saying to me, I can still hear his words, because I felt so intimidated by the fact that I knew nothing. And he had, he had coached five, or I mean, he'd played five years of university basketball. And uh, he said to me, he said, Keith, you're a really good coach. You're really good because you relate to the kids and you, you've read all the books. You've t like I went and took all my coaching certifications and everything. I'm, you know, nationally certified as a level one basketball coach, all that stuff. But he said, you're a really good coach because you really care that the kids learn the skills right, right? And so the training aspect of all of this was so important. Um, are we still having trouble with the Okay, okay, we're having trouble today with the computer, so it's okay, I'll keep going. Second uh, Timothy 2.15, uh, I'll just read it quick. Modern English version says it this way, study to show yourself approved by God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, it takes work. It takes work, it takes training, it takes effort, it takes, it took me hours to learn how to teach kids how to dribble a ball, and how to shoot a ball, and how to pass a ball, right? But you know what? Even more important than all of that is learning God's Word and getting it down in our hearts because the more well-equipped we are, the more we understand His Word, we more, the more that we understand what God's Word says for us and means to us, the more well-equipped we will be to step out there in the world, okay? The more training that we did with those kids, the more well-equipped they were to get on the court. The more time you spend in God's Word, the more equipped you'll be for whatever comes in. And it's not just about, you know, uh, sharing with others, although that's a really important part of it. But sometimes you just need to know God's word and get it in your heart to get through the day. You know, Pastor Gene and I had kind of a week like that this week. Like we, it was like, wow, the, like the, the year has started off like fairly wild in terms of all the things that have happened, even within our small congregation, right? Realize that's the wrong thing. I shouldn't be small, but anyhow, within our church, our growing church, that's good. Okay. So even within our church, there are so many things that have happened since the beginning of the year. Do I need to change my too? Okay. Okay. We'll get there. We were talking to somebody uh, yesterday. I'll just turn this off. And the person, this person uh, was from another church, and uh, she said, like we were sharing with her some of the things that have been going on, some of the things that have been happening with our church and with our people. And she said, you know, our pastor said the other day, he's never seen a year start off like this, like with things, like just stuff coming in people's lives and so many health issues and so many things. You know, like the enemy, his time must be so short because I know that, you know, like he is just he is just doing everything he can just to.
cause trouble, to reap havoc wherever he's able to. But you know what? God has promised us that we will overcome. We will be the champions. We will be the ones who get through, who, who emerge victorious on the other end. Why? Well, a few things. Okay, so number one, I said training. We need to learn the Word of God. We need to get it in our hearts. And we need to do the effort to learn how to live according to godly principles. You know, anybody can go through life and, and taking everybody else's advice about how, how to live and all the things they should do and everything. But it takes effort to get in God's Word and get His heart and to get what He says and what He said in His Word for us, right? So I'll go back. I'll quote it once more. Study to show yourself, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved by God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word word of truth. Amen. Okay, so back to my acrostic a team. Second letter of the word team is E, and I named this one the expectation. Now, I don't know if you're able to put the, yeah, there we go. Okay, expectation. Okay, so let's go back to Ephesians. Oh, wait, I'm going to read this in the Passion Translation just because I, I love it. Uh, I've been reading this verse lots. Ephesians 3.20 in the Passion Translation says this, uh, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request. How much? Infinitely more. Infinitely more. Think about that. Infinite. Infinite is a pretty big number, isn't it? But he will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I could have, I could have used energize too, but anyhow. His miraculous power constantly energizes you. Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. What is the point of this verse? The point of this verse is that we need to raise our expectations. How many have heard people say, oh, well, the, the phrase is, oh, don't get your hopes up. Have you heard that? Guess what? That's not a biblical concept, right? That's actually opposite to the word. It's amazing how many catchphrases that we hear out there that are opposite of what God's word says. God's word says, I need to raise my expectation. I need to expect more. And that's why we said in 2024, we are believing God for more in 2020, 2024. Okay? Because we're supposed to raise our expectations. In Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11 and 1, and I'll read it from the Amplified, it says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. I love the way the Amplified says it because it just says, it's what we don't see, but by faith we believe. We raise our expectations. And what is that? That is the definition of hope. The, the, actually, the, uh, the definition of hope, the proper Bible definition of hope, and it, like, not, like a lot of people in the world, oh, well, you know, it's not only don't get your hopes up, or, but if they do get their hopes up, it's like, well, I hope this, or I hope that. I hope I win the lottery, or, or I, I hope we can, you know, I hope I can get married someday, or I hope that we'll have grandchildren, or I hope that, you know, whatever it is. But it, it, sounds like, it sounds like they're, you know, drawing numbers at a bingo game or something, right, when they talk about that kind of hope. Like maybe your number will come up and maybe it won't, right? But that's not hope. A Bible hope is a what? A confident expectation. Everybody say confident expectation. That's a Bible hope. Confident expectation. Now, are we able to put up a picture or not? No, keep going. Okay. Okay. want to tell you about my friend. And uh, he may even be watching online. I don't know. But anyhow, my friend is, is um, uh, Charlie. 
<laughs> okay. And Charlie played for the Edmonton Eskimos, and uh, he was a professional football player. And the Edmonton Eskimos, and I realize they changed the name to Elks, but I'm just going to call them Eskimos for now if that's okay. The Eskimos were famous and because they, what made them a dynasty was that they won five Grey Cups consecutively. From 78 through 82, they won the Grey Cup in football. And I don't, to my knowledge, no other team has ever done that, right? And I don't even know, if, like in the U.S., you know, things they call a dynasty when you've, you know, won three, you know, or whatever, right? But the Eskimos won five in a row. And actually, just to take it one, expand it one step further, in a 10-year space of time from 73 to 82, they went to the Grey Cup nine times out of those 10 years. Okay, so today, yeah, and I, I realize if you're not a football fan, you don't care, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Okay, so today is Super Bowl, okay? Everybody is super excited about the teams that are in the Super Bowl. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because it's a rematch from a couple of years ago, right? But the one team, I think, has been there three years, and they're ecstatic about these guys because they've got to the game three times, right? The Eskimos, nine times in 10 years. <laughs> they only missed one out of that 10-year sequence, right? That is a pretty amazing thing. Oh, we got the picture? Okay. This is a picture of the 19, what is it? 19, uh, must be 82, no, 78, 1978. Okay, this would have been the first year of the, and Charlie is on the left there, front row. The, um, the, this would have been the first year of their five-year uh, streak of winning the Grey Cups, right? And uh, you can pray for our friend Charlie. And, uh, you know, uh, he's had some health challenges, and he needs a victory. We just lift him up in Jesus' name. But we love Charlie. But you know what? Here's the thing. You know, the Eskimos, when they, Charlie told me that when they would go on the field, they, like, it wasn't, they were actually surprised if they didn't win. Okay? Does that make sense? Like, they were, they had such a winning attitude. They had such a record of winning. They had such, like, they would go on the field. He said it wasn't a question of if we were going to win. It, it, like, we knew we were going to win before they, ever, before they ever kicked off the football, right? That, that was the confident expectation. That's the kind of hope. That's the kind of confidence that we need to have in our God and all that he can do in our lives. And when we come facing an opposition, yeah, sure, they faced all kinds of teams. They had to play a lot of games in order to get there. But if we have the attitude that we are victorious before we ever are in the battle, guess what our attitude will be when the battle comes in life? And when we're faced with that bad report, or when we're faced with those things that come, and, you know, we, we prayed and we, we talked about that earlier in worship. But you know what? A confident expectation says, no matter what, I am going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Amen. So now the next, next letter in my, uh, in my word, how am I doing, is A. And I, I chose anointed, okay? So... Um, Anointed, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Again, we're still in Ephesians 4, I guess. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, and this time let's start at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to, effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, here's the, here's the point of this passage. 
we are anointed. We are anointed for God's service. We are, we, God has called us. He has a high calling for every one of us. And He has anointed us. He's prepared us. He, he is expecting that we are going to be His people in the earth. He's expecting that we will be the people who will share His love, who will show, what does it say, the unity of the faith. Be humble and gentle. Wow. You could probably preach a whole sermon, right, on these couple of verses here, right? Huh. What are the characteristics of a, uh, I'll say, a team city view Christian, right? What are the characteristics? Somebody that's humble. Somebody who understands that they've been called of God. Somebody who understands the anointing that is in their life. And all the anointing means is it's, it's like a commissioning. In the Old Testament, we would see where they would anoint people with oil. And they were basically saying, you are empowered. You are commissioned to do these things for God. That's the anointing. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Wow. That's something we, you know, it's not, it's not always easy, but it is what we're called to do, okay? The, I, like, I didn't write this, okay, right? It's God's Word, okay? And He wants us to be united, united in peace. He wants us to be united as believers. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called when I, when I see one, 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 this is the key to a team being successful. It's the, it's the unity. The, it's the, the, when they come together, when they're able to, and in a sense, it's, you know, do what God has called you to do. And when a, when a player on a team do, does what they're called to do, it's, you know, knowing their position, knowing what they're supposed to do. No, you know, when I think of all the different sports, the key is playing and doing what you are supposed to be doing. Don't try and do somebody else's job. And you know what? That's true in the body of Christ. Don't try and be somebody that you're not. Be the person that God's called you to be. Be the person that He has anointed you to be. Be all that you, like to be all that you can be, just be what He wants you to be, right? And uh, the other verse that comes to mind is 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. I'll read it from the New Living. It says this. It says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for His glory. For it is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised to us. I love that. The Holy Spirit, is, it's, like the, it's like the empowering installment that he puts into our lives. When the Holy Spirit is in our lives, it empowers us to be and to, to do all that we are commissioned to do, all that God wants us to do. And that's what that passage is talking about in Corinthians. Um, okay, uh, next picture if we can, if it'll work. Okay, uh, this picture, guess who this picture is? Anybody know? Somebody should know, recognize. It is Portia, that's right. And Portia had the opportunity to play some high-level volleyball. When I think of playing your position, <laughs> there's like... Volleyball is really critical because the other team is constantly trying to spike the ball across the net, right? If you understand volleyball. And if you don't play your position, guess where the ball goes? Point. <laughs> That's it. It hits the floor and, well, enough of those and you'll be going home, right? That's how it works in volleyball, right? Now, it's maybe not quite as obvious in some of the other sports. Like in football, there's a whole bunch of guys all running around there, all banging into each other. And so did they play their position right or didn't they play their position right? That's why I picked uh, volleyball and the picture of Portia because I'll tell you when there's only, it, what is it, six? It's six, right? Six people on the court? I'll tell you, that's a big space to cover with six people, right? Have you guys, as, I, look, I feel like I'm, you know, talking about a sport that you've never seen before. You guys, are you aware of the game called volleyball? Have you watched volleyball? You know how volleyball works, right? 
This is a, a common thing. As little kids, we learn it in school, right? You play volleyball. But the point is, if you are not in position, it's game over. The other team is going to score all the points. Well, guess what? You know, if we don't play the position that God has for us, you know, if we don't follow up on things, if we don't follow the word, if we don't live by godly principles, we're just opening the door for the enemy to score points on us. Amen? I, I don't, I'll tell you, I, there's no situation where I want Satan to ever get a point against my team. Okay? And I'll say my City View team, right? I want my City View team to score all the points, and I'm not being greedy. <laughs> I'm, I'm following the word. Okay? God wants us to be victorious, right? But you know what? Uh, we have to, we need to be, um, we need to understand our calling, our position, the anointing that comes in our lives. Okay, well, the last letter in my uh, acrostic is M, and I, I chose mission, okay? Mission, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says this, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. The head of the church is Christ. We are his body. We are his family. We are the people that God wants to use to achieve the things in the earth, right? Verse 16, what does it say? From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. Boy, it seems like we've come full circle. Building itself up in love as each part does its work. We need to realize that the unity of the faith and the unity of what God has called us to is to be together, to work together, to be unified, right? There's, there's just something about when we are united and when we are supporting each other. Pastor Gene and I were talking about that this week, right? And it, it is so important that we recognize the areas where we can support each other. Maybe you're strong in an area and somebody else needs some help or some encouragement. You can, you can be their encouragement. You can speak into their life. You can encourage them. You can, you can bring a life where, there might, where maybe they're hopeless. But you can stir them up, encourage them to be hopeful, right? And uh, uh, Dale sometimes says about the uh, our men's group, he says, uh, the expression is no man left behind. When I think of that expression, I think of that SEAL team again, right? Where it's life or death. And they, it, what they do and, and how they pull together to accomplish their mission, they do not want anyone left behind. Recently in the news, there was some... Navy SEALs that, that uh, went over the side. They, the one fellow, I, as I understand the story, he fell into the water, and another Navy SEAL had this attitude, no one left behind, jumped in the water to rescue the guy, and unfortunately they didn't find either one of them. They were two Navy SEALs lost at sea. But the whole point is that when you ha we have to have that attitude as believers. We have to have that attitude as Team City View. We have to have that attitude as God's children, as people that are part of the family of God. There should be no one left behind. If somebody is struggling, we should be willing to, to reach out to them and help them in whatever way we can so that we are all committed to the singular goal or mission that God has called us to. And he didn't just call a few to, to you know, it's not like, I, I don't know, it's not like the corporate world where God, you know, just chose a few to, to, you know, be high and lifted up and then get all the accolades and all the glory, right? It's not like that in the body of Christ. God wants every single one of us to be lifted up. He wants every single one of us to experience the victory, to experience the glory in, in our lives. Matthew 28 sums it all up. The New King James Version says it this way, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, if we, if we understand what God has called us to, there will be no one left behind. If we understand what God has called us to, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that everyone, every member comes along. And every person that's out there in this neighborhood who maybe we haven't even met yet, but they need Jesus. We don't want to leave them behind. We want to share with them the excitement of what, it like, what it's like to live for Jesus. A few years ago, a movie came out, and uh, it was called uh, Hacksaw Ridge. I think, Dallas, I think it was you and me that went to see that, right? And uh, it, was a, it was a faith-based movie. And, but there was a big disclaimer because it was pretty graphic, the movie. And uh, it, the story is told of a fellow by the name of Desmond Doss. And uh, he signed up uh, for the military, but he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And so he, there was two things. He didn't want to shoot a gun, and he didn't want to kill anybody, right? That, that was a deal. But yet he still wanted to serve his country, and so he signed up and... He almost didn't make it through his training because they kept saying, well, if he can't shoot a gun, how are we supposed to pass him from training, right? But he, what he signed up for he was he wanted to be a combat medic, right? And, and as the story goes, um, and that's what the story Hacksaw Ridge is all about, and he went and they, they estimate that in one day in a, an attack where they were trying to get, I think it was in Japan, they were trying to, uh, go into this one place, and they had dropped all these guys on the beach, and they were trying to advance. And they estimate that he saved 75 people's lives that day, 75 soldiers. Basically, what he did was he was up there where the fighting was going on, and when people were going down, he'd take them, and he would drag them back, and he'd lower them down to safety. There was a, a ridge, the Hacksaw Ridge. That's where the name comes from, right? And he would bring them out. And then guess what? He'd climb back up, and he'd go get another one. Boy, when I get a picture of that. Here's a guy, he's, he doesn't have a gun because he wouldn't, he didn't want to shoot anybody. That was, right? And he'd climb back up, and he'd go get another one, and he'd bring them to safety. And then he'd climb back up, he'd go get another one. He'd bring it to safety. There's a picture there. The picture that I challenge you with is that that should be the picture of us as Christians, as believers. If we believe God's Word is true, if we believe that this Word, that God's truth, the salvation that Jesus provided makes a difference in people's lives, we should be willing to climb up that ridge and go after the lost and the hurting and the broken. God wants to use you. Every one of us is called. Every one of us is called just to touch someone's life. Whether that's just giving somebody a hug after church, or whether it's going out of your way to bless somebody, to minister to them. Maybe they need food. Maybe they need clothing. Maybe they need finances. Maybe they need a healing in their body. But think of this guy climbing back up that ridge to go and rescue another one and another one and another one and another one and another one. I want you to get that picture. We're going to pray in a minute. But before I do it, I promised you I'd tell you who's, who's going to win the game today. I'll tell you, I can tell you with absolute certainty who's going to win the Super Bowl game today. It will be the team who has trained and practiced and done excellent in their positions. They know their job. They're playing their positions. They're not trying to do somebody else's job. They've trained physically. They're strong. They're healthy. They're not hiding any, any injuries and stuff. They're going to get on the field. They're going to perform physically to the top of their expectation. And it'll be the team that has an expectation of winning, like I talked about my friend Charlie. The team that expects that they're going to come in, and it, they won't, not, not somebody who comes in and says, oh, I 
I think we can. I think we can beat those other guys. Sorry, eh, you're probably done already, right? You might as well just, you know, pack your bags and go home. You got to come in with a confident expectation of winning, both mentally and emotionally. Have a winning attitude, and then you need to play your position, right? How many times? I mean, if anybody, I know, I know because we've watched lots of football games. But it, pick any, pick any sport that you want, right? We talked about volleyball earlier, but. It'll be the team that the guys play their positions. Nobody will get that, that long 80-yard streak for the end zone today if the safety is playing his position or if the corner is playing his position or whatever the, whatever the guys are that are supposed to tackle them to stop them in their tracks. And the last thing is the team that is going to win today is the team that understands that their mission is to win the championship, not just show up. How many of you in, in school growing up got a participation ribbon for being involved in some activity? And I remember they <laughs> she's shaking her head. You didn't do that? Oh, man, in the school I grew up, they didn't want anybody to feel bad, okay? So if you didn't get the, you know, the gold ribbon or the silver ribbon, or like if you weren't, the, they, they, they used to have... Okay, when I grew up, I don't know, does anybody relate to this? They had ribbons, right? And it had like one, two, three on the ribbons, right? And, and then the rest of the ribbons just said, you know, participant, <laughs> participant. Guess what? If these guys show up today, the, the team that shows up with the most guys wanting to get the participation ribbon, that they just want to get the financial bonus for making it to the game, they're not going to be the ones who win. It has to be the guys who have the championship mentality. And they're going to go out and they're going to execute and do everything that they know to do to be the champions. And that's who's going to win the game today. Okay. Now, what, what I can also tell you one other thing about the team of the, the championship team. Their colors are what? Red and black. <laughs> I think aren't both teams red and black? Okay. Both teams are red. Okay. So anyhow, the team that has the red, they're going to win. So anyhow, so see, now you can say Pastor Keith 100% predicted who's going to win the game today. Let me go back to, uh, let me go back to um, the mission that we're called to. The mission is to share Jesus Christ and to really, to unify our hearts together as one body of believers. Hebrews 10, I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. Hebrews 10, verse 23 says this, So now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps His promises. Everybody say always. How often does God keep His promises? Always. Knowing, knowing. Not just thinking or hoping or maybe suspecting or, you know, knowing, knowing that God always keeps his promises. Verse 24, discover creative ways to encourage each other and to motivate them towards acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Eager to encourage and urge each other on. The strength of our team is determined by the sum of the individual members. At City View, we have a ministry team, at least people that we call ministry team. But guess what? Every one of you has a part to play in that. Every one of you has a part to play. Well, who's on the team? Who's on Team City View? Everyone. Because we've all been called to our part, our place within the body of Christ. Now, we want to minister to, to you today, but you know what? We're going to do a little different today. This is the picture that I have. And actually, I just want to say thank you to those 
who are watching online, I know we had some technology issues, so if I don't know if we have to repost it or whatever we have to do, but whatever it is, <laughs> thank you for tuning in and watching. But for those of you that are here today, I praise you, Lord. I praise you.